I guess I'm here. How are you? It's so weird. I, I need to get my intro music or something together. Um, haven't gotten there yet. I'm sorry. How are you this morning? It is the 1st of June, 2022. Real estate's in a tizzy. The real estate market's in a tizzy. Some people are like, hey, we better list now or we're never going to get the money that we've always wanted for this house. And then buyers are like, you know what? I've been dealing with this for six months, seven months. I'm, I'm tired. I don't care. I'm not interested in your terms of above asking. No appraise, no appraisal uh, writer, no inspections, you know, buying as is. I'm just not interested. So, you know, you can just leave the house on the market. And then that, we have other people that are... Um, Say well, I'll I'll do all those things. I'll buy all those. I'll, I'll I'll take all those uh those concessions, and then they go to finance the house uh, at the end of the day, and it turns out that they were uh, pre-approved on a three percent um, mortgage, and the rates are now five five point two five point three, and so they can't afford the house that they just agreed to buy. That's the real estate market. Now I saw a powerful video, and I and I would like to give credit to the person, but I'm. I'm not going to give credit to them because I don't know who they are, but I was on TikTok yesterday and a wonderful video uh, about how the Zillow iBuying program was terrible in the sense that they would go in and they'd buy one or two houses for maybe 300,000, uh, but they were going to buy six or seven in the neighborhood. So they'd buy these first two for 300 and then um, they would sell the houses like, you know, four, five and six, they would sell them for like, you know, 400,000 or 420,000. And so uh, they would take those profits and then um, they would, you know, basically put people out of the, the housing market because uh, you'd all be renters. Uh, does that happen? I think it does. I think it's going to happen a lot more often. Um, the weird thing is, is you say, um, well, that can't happen because buyers won't pay that much money. Well, what if the buyer is an I buyer in the first place? So like, let's go through it a little bit closer. So let's say there's a house. Okay. Some seller wants to sell their house. They don't want to do anything with it. They just want to have, have it be gone. So they call Zillow. This was at the time when Zillow was operating as an iBuyer. They say, Hey, I would like you to buy my house. They come out and they say, sure. Our, our estimate says it's worth, you know, 300,000. They say, okay, well let's sell it. This is great. We don't have to do anything. You'll buy it for 300. So yeah. So they buy it for 300. Okay. And then there's another neighbor, there's another house in the neighborhood. Now the comp just showed that that house was worth 300. So Zillow comes in and says to the next person, you know, it could just be on the market. They say, well, we'll buy it for 320. Well, that's $20,000 more than the next house. This is great. Well, now all of a sudden the comps are at 320 for the neighborhood. Third house goes on the market. They're like, maybe they put it up for 320, but Zillow comes in and says, all cash offer will be at 340. Wow. Now the first person that sold at 300 looks like an idiot now because now we're up at 340. And this just goes on and on. You say, well, that can't be. That can't be because um, there's other buyers in the market. Well, what happens when you get an all cash offer versus one that's with a mortgage? You take the all cash offer. What happens when the all cash offer is higher than any of the other offers? You know, if the if someone else is offered like on a $340,000 house asking price, if someone offers 360 cash and someone else with a mortgage offers 350, you're going to take the 360 with cash, most likely. Um, especially if it's no inspections or anything else because it's an institutional buyer and they don't care. Um, and you say, well, well, that's not, that's not, that can't be what's happening. Um, but that is, that is what happened. I mean, there, and then what happens is, is when Zillow owns four houses in the neighborhood, okay, they don't have to sell right away. They don't, they, don't, they don't have to turn that thing. They can just hold it as long as they want to. And then as they, what's happening is they bought so many houses that there was no, there's no supply. Tremendous amount of demand, both from Wall Street investors like Zillow and, you know, common people. And so, once you can restrict the supply of housing, 
I mean, you can you can play with the prices, and that's what's going on now. Is it? Did Zillow sit down and intentionally say we're going to pick a neighborhood in Arizona, and we're going to pick this block, and we're going to when we're going to make it so that nobody can afford to live there within the matter of six months? No. No, that's not what happened. It's just what ends up happening when you have these players, these Wall Street players in the marketplace. Uh, is there something that we should do about it? Yeah. But what? But what? I mean, if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, whatever you are, figure out a way to stop Wall Street from buying single family homes at a mass scale and inflating the prices. Figure that out. And here's the thing that I've noticed, and I'm not trying to be uh, mean. You know, we have Airbnb and VRBO, okay, the short-term rentals. Some people are, are quite opposed to the idea of a short-term rental in a single-family neighborhood, possibly as they should be. And what is the point of having a single-family uh, homes in a neighborhood if they're all leased out or rented out for short-term rentals? It's, it's, it's more like just a single-family home but with kind of a condo feel which nobody really wants. So I'm not, I mean, it's, it's what, what, what I'm trying to say is if you, if you were to ban wall street from buying homes in a single family subdivision, you still run into the fact that some owners of homes within a subdivision would be thrilled to lease their property out for the weekend uh, on short term rentals. So now do you say you can't do that either? You know, like, where does it stop? Like, how do we decide it, it, if, you know, if someone has their assets in an LLC, are they allowed to buy a house in cash? Um, uh, what about a trust? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And it's how do you, how do you re regulate such a thing? I mean, to me, as with many things, was there a time when it was a good investment to own a single family home? Yeah, Absolutely. Was it a good investment to lease one? Absolutely. But once all the big players figured out, that, you know, they could make money, you, you, you know, you as an individual are toast. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So I just wanted to go over that scenario because I think it's relevant. I think no one talks about it, but I'm not sure why. Um, if you know. Put it, put it in the comments below. Um, put it in the chat. Come and hang out with me. Um, so that's that was the first thing that I noticed. Now, the second thing that I noticed is uh, I have a young buyer in his uh, mid-20s. So let me get her. Young buyer in his mid-20s. And we were talking about this particular house. And I said, yeah, it's the housing market is terrible. This house would have sold for 140000 Actually did sell for 140000 three years ago. And now we're looking at uh, this particular house is going to go for about one eighty five. So $45,000 increase in price in three years. And he was like, yeah, our generation's always getting screwed. Uh, and I thought about that statement for a while. And... Um, it's it's not it's it's anecdotal, but but I've always felt like my generation really got the short end of things, and I and I kind of wonder if every generation thinks that they got the short end of things. The, the one thing that I know that um, many of us didn't have to deal with was like I wasn't in the Iraq War. I wasn't. I was. It was an age thing. It was. Um, it, it was very odd. To me, the the war uh, in Iraq that wasn't a war, if they would have declared a war, it would have been a different thing. But if they would have declared a war, then they would have had to institute the draft. And uh, they didn't want to do that. They just wanted to fire a lot of missiles into a country. Uh, the military industrial complex on full display, on full send uh, there. And uh, once you saw that in Iraq, then you can see these other... Um, these other traipses across the world for, for peace, uh, as long as we're spending lots of money blowing things up. Uh, so we had that. 
so the people that did fight in Iraq that were injured, um, yeah, that wasn't, they did get the short end of it. There's no question. Those people do have a right to be upset. Um, but then I look back at like Vietnam and World War II. Those people got the short end too. So even within one's lifetime, there's a number of instances where, you know, uh, you get the short end of it. Uh, it's easy to feel that way. When I graduated college the first time, uh, probably in 2000, 2001, I'm guessing, uh, the job market was terrible. And most people said, well, don't even try to get a job, just go to graduate school. Um, and I don't know, I failed on so many levels that it's not really, it's not, it's, it wasn't one thing. Let's put it that way. Just a number of failures in a row. Um, but I guess where I'm coming from on, on, on the generation always eating it is I don't think it's good to think that way. I don't think it benefits you. And even if it is true, even if it is true, I, I think you have to um, go forth with a, a, a maybe a positive, uh, a positive mind frame, a positive, you know, hey, you know, we'll get through this because that's all you have. You, you really only have the space between your ears at the end of the day. I mean, that's that's who's going to win the, the fights. Now, things are depressing. Things are depressing, at least for the the people that I associate with. High gas prices, high home prices, high energy prices. I mean, if you think that electricity is going to be cheap, high food prices. Okay. Wages stagnant. Okay. Um, not a good time. Not a good time. Easy to get down. Okay. But it doesn't serve you to be miserable. It doesn't help. And so I would just, I would just like to put forth that if you are feeling down, that's okay. You all feel down. It's all right. But don't let that consume your, uh, your daily thoughts. The majority of your thoughts should be positive. I know that's hard. Could be a lot of things going on that are miserable, but, I've, I've caught myself in the last couple of weeks, like being down. Um, and there's no, it's, it, you can't get anywhere. It d- doesn't help. So this is my, uh, this is my thought. Could your generation be part of, a, should they, could they be getting the shaft? Absolutely. Uh, is there anything you're going to do about it? Probably not. Probably not. Um, I've noticed like with our voting patterns and things of that nature. Uh, and it took me a long time. I'm in my forties now. A lot of people will say like, Oh, the Republicans are the party of the wealthy or they're a bunch of racists. Okay. So then you can't vote for Republicans. All right. So you have to vote for Democrats. So you vote for Democrats. And then it turns out that, you know, all your donors on the Democrat side or your Facebook and your, I mean, mega billionaires, you know, and, they don't do anything. I mean, the same things happen. The same racist policies are in place. Same, you know, same stuff. You're voting for a uniparty. Both parties are in are in the interest of corporations, and not the people. And I'm not. And I'm not full populist. I mean, I, I think there's there's definitely a place for, um, you know, your businesses and whatnot. I mean, I have my own business, but but it's clearly tilted dramatically to this corporate style of, of governance. That's, that's, that's absolutely miserable for the people. And, uh, it's a, it's a shame. I don't see, you're going to, I don't see how you're going to vote, vote yourself out of this one. You know, I just don't. So anyway, anyway, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be doing the live stream, at least not at the right time. No, now I can definitely say I won't be doing it tomorrow. I I have a, a road trip tomorrow. I have a road trip today, but I have time for the live stream tomorrow. I'm just not going to be in town. Um, so you may be looking for that live stream. It's not it's not going to be there. Uh, I will I will stream again on Friday. 
it's a strange week with Memorial Day, and I didn't I didn't stream uh, on Monday, but uh, but anyway, we'll get to it now. Do I have anything else before we get started? Well, I would like to say yesterday I had I had a little bit of time in the afternoon, and I was able to go outside and just sit in the backyard and watch the world go by. And that's another thing I wanted to offer um, those of you who are kind of down, like get outside, get some fresh air, get off your phone, just be alone with your thoughts and just see, you know, see what's up there, see what's going on. What, what are we thinking about and why are we thinking about it and how does it, you know, how does it go with X, Y, and Z? And, um. My backyard, uh, unfortunately, I got got some things going on where it's not the uh, peaceful place that I wish it was all the time. Um, but, you know, we often look at um, we often look at our yards as like a secondary reason to buy a house. So if you have a house that's, you know, beautiful. Um, on a, on a small lot, it's like, well, it's okay. We let less grass to cut, but if you can have a nice flat yard where you can sit outside and and just, you know, be left alone, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. And as we see all the time with luxury homes, you know, especially I'd say within the last 20 years, you know, the outdoor space is as part of the home is important. It's not necessarily what I wouldn't say the landscaping so much as I would say the design of the home. Are there spaces where they are covered, uh, where you can have, you know, outdoor furniture and grills and sinks and stuff like that? Now, in in places like St. Louis, it's a little more difficult because in July, the humidity is awful and it's hot. It's just, it's a terrible, terrible place. And and I'm saying that as somebody who's lived here the majority of my life. Um, But still, like right now in St. Louis, right now, the weather is perfect. It's just perfect. It's wonderful. There's a little breeze, maybe 80 degrees, no humidity. It's just really nice. Now, I know that it's going to get worse, and and that's that's the way it is. But anyway, when you're looking at a house, you may not realize that you would like to have a yard. I, I, would, just, I would just say, look, I mean, a yard matters. A lot of times, um, a lot of times, people will look at the house in the pictures and they don't even see the backyard. They don't even see the front yard or they don't care. And then they go to the house and they're like, there's something about this house I don't like. Well, it's, it's possible that it's the lot that it sits on. Not many people believe that. Like it's weird. You say we have, um, we have St. Louis County and then we have Jefferson County. Now I don't have, I don't feel like I have any biases uh, for either place. But St. Louis County, for the most part, pretty flat, at least the south where I live, for the most part, pretty flat. But you get in Jefferson County, and it's very, very hilly. Uh, The opportunity for walkout basements and, um, you know, strange strange backyards that kind of fall off a cliff, um, very prevalent um, in Jefferson County. And so, you know, if you can find a lot, in Jefferson County that is flat and you can have a nice size yard. I mean, it's, it's, it's an asset. It's really something. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. You know, the house is important, right? The house, but the lot that it sits on, I, I mean, I say it's, I say it's worth 50% of the, the property myself. Whenever I work with buyers, one of the first things I say is, uh, you know, if you're interested in a house, why don't you go, take a a drive by it and say, well, they, they, a lot of, I'd say of the people that I tell to do that, I'd say 80% don't, they would rather just show up with me and waste each of both of our time with the idea that, Oh, I didn't know this house was on a corner lot. I didn't know this house, um, was on a hill. The lot was on a hill, but 50% of the house, I mean, 50% of the deal is pretty much on the lot. So if you don't like the lot, you're not going to like the house. There's no point. In, in making an offer. Uh, in fact, maybe two weeks ago, I was in Jefferson County and there was a house with a pool, but the yard was as like a triangle. It looks stupid. 
it, the backyard literally looks stupid. There was there's a pool, and then it blocked off like this odd triangle. So, just something to think about if you know if you can drive by a house now, and you say, "Well, John, you're being lazy because you know if we just go once, it's you know you know you just don't want to go see the house." It's not really that. It's the more opportunities like to to me. You go to this house one time, okay. And you're supposed to make an offer on this house. You've been to it once. You know nothing about the neighborhood, nothing about this, anything. But you're going to go make an offer on this house? In my opinion, if you drive by and take a look, see what the lot's like, see what the people are, drive three or four times by the house before you put an offer. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not stalking the house. You're not stalking the people. But just get a good sense of where, you're, where you are. You know, how close are you to the groceries? How close are you to like a, a quick stop? Like these are, these are, how close are you to like a Walgreens or a drugstore? I mean, these things are important. These make where you live uh, valuable. And so, I mean, drive by a house before you put an offer on it, you know, more than once. That's the, the thing I'm seeing um, that's difficult for me is they say that like 87 people 87 percent of the population that has bought a, a house in the past year um, has buyer's remorse and and i've i've done podcasts i've talked about it in the past i i could not live with myself as a buyer's agent if 87 percent of the people that i worked with were miserable with the home that they bought i mean that would just drive me insane and even in this ridiculous market, there's things that you can do to uh, not have buyer's remorse, to prevent the feelings of buyer's remorse. And one of those is drive the drive the neighborhood. When it's active, go drive the neighborhood. Just you don't have to get out, you don't have to do anything. You just drive it, and then go back again. Like one of the one of the phenomenons in St. Louis is uh, in during the day in St. Louis city, if you go down the street, there's plenty of places to park. There's no cars on the, on the, on the, on the streets, but you know, six o'clock in the evening, go try to find a parking spot on some of these streets. And it's like impossible. If you don't have a garage, you're toast. And people don't realize that people go look at the house. They go, they go uh, take a look at the house, you know, on Tuesday at two in the afternoon and they're like, this is great. We can just park in front. It's wonderful. There's nothing, nobody here. It's wonderful. And then they, then they're shocked when they actually move in the house and all of a sudden they've got no place to park and there's people everywhere. It's like, this could be avoided if you just drove the neighborhood beforehand more than once. So, um, this is a way for me. I mean, this is a way to avoid buyer's remorse. Um, I need to stop saying, um, I've been working on the, I've been working on the live stream and, and more so I've, I've been watching Ricada, uh, Nick Ricada a lot because he's good at it. He's, he's the model for live streaming. And, uh, some of the things that he said yesterday that I was, that I was watching now, I don't think he, I don't think it was the stream from last night, but he was talking about how, uh, with law tube, you know, it gave people exposure that that wouldn't otherwise get it and that there's people on youtube that are always going to have like you know no audience and the hardest thing to do is to get an audience and boy am i experiencing that boy am i experiencing that i i cannot for the life of me get subscriptions i don't know i don't know why i don't think my program is that bad compared to others i've seen uh, i think we could do more i mean one of the things that is causing some problems is this, like do you have any guests? Can we have a guest on? Well, no, we can't. No one's coming on a live stream with 12 subscribers. Like nobody of consequence. So I may never get out of this, which I hate to say it, but, but this is the case. Um, and with that, I mean, you know, deal with it, I guess. Uh, I saw another, I mean, TikTok all over the place yesterday. I saw an interesting TikTok with a, a, an agent that said, you know, doing real estate videos. And then you realize that the only people watching your real estate videos are real estate agents. But that's okay. 
Um, I saw a tweet uh, from a guy that owns Crown Candy Kitchen here in uh, St. Louis. And they said, the, uh, he said, the important thing is that you need to know who your, um, know who your customers are. And he said, anyone that's alive. And that's where I'm at too. I don't know that, I don't know that real estate agents would particularly like my program because they may be coming at it from a different perspective. For example, I'm, I'm a broker. I have one agent and, you know, we just go and, and do the business the best we can. We're not on some like high falutin team where there's 30 people and you know you're you're selling houses left and right but your margins are not great um and you're churning agents left and right i mean that's not the business that i'm in and i don't want to be in that business so uh maybe that's not the right um maybe that's not the right audience member uh, maybe they'll say everything i say is wrong like you just need to slam people into houses uh, don't doesn't matter what they think uh because they're never going to use you again anyway. So just go find somebody new. Uh, certainly a, certainly a, a thought. Um, then there's the general public. And like, do you want to talk about real estate every day if you're not involved in it? I don't know. That's why I try to talk about different things because, you know, if we just talk about real estate all the time, it's, it's not even fun for me. So, you know, if you are in the, if you do happen to be watching this, it's like I said, it's 2022 June. I started on YouTube last year, June 31st, I believe was my first video. Um, but anyway, hey, subscribe, help me out a little bit. I'd appreciate it. I don't think it, I don't think it costs you anything really. You know, I mean, I've got time, so let's talk about. It. I was, you know, Alan Dershowitz. You may not like him. I. I remember him in the OJ trial, but, um, and I, and I've, he's always been not where I'm at politically at all, but I always kind of, I always kind of listened to him. I, I didn't have any issue listening to other people. Um, and I did think it was funny that there was, there was a case that he did one time where I believe that his his client was charged for murder, but the person he shot was already dead before his client shot them. I thought that was kind of funny in a weird way. But anyway, he, he was on YouTube at first with the Durst show, and it was I was watching it and it didn't didn't do really well. Then he disappeared, and then I just saw him on Twitter the other day, and he's got the show back. I, I watched a few and, and they're great. Okay. Where, where in the world would you be able to listen to a lawyer that's, you know, defended OJ, defended Trump? I mean, you know, argued before the Supreme Court. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know that, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't say he's one of the greatest lawyers ever because I don't, I wouldn't know how to rank a lawyer. But anyway, at least I would say in pop culture, somebody that was relevant. I think yesterday on one of his shows, he was at like 8,000 people. Which for YouTube and LawTube in general, that's terrible. I mean, that's that's just awful. And so it's, it's humbling. If someone like Dershowitz, who can go on CNN or at the time CNN, he's not allowed on CNN anymore, on Fox, on all the, I mean, and just to have the notoriety and fame and still be only be able to haul in, you know, 8,000 viewers on a, on a particular show. I mean, that just tells you how wild YouTube is. I'll be honest. I mean, when I look at the age breakdown, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking 18 to 25 year olds and, and, uh, those guys, those guys, I think my my audience is predominantly male, but those guys would not would not know Alan Dershowitz from from anyone. Have no idea who he is and wouldn't care. So, so it's kind of weird to see someone so famous um, do so poorly on YouTube. But it's 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 great for someone like me because I'm not famous. I don't have a huge following. I don't have anything that like. I mean, I'm, I'm in a real estate space, 
that's that's really all I I care to talk about. You know, I mean, I, I don't have like 16 other subjects where I'm an expert. And so if, you know, if he can do that poorly and I'm doing that poorly here, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I don't take it personally. I do like the idea of a live stream. Would love to have the chat active. Um, and hopefully someday it's possible. Um, I have one video on YouTube that just gets views every day, like not a lot, maybe 30 views a day, 30, 35 views a day. And it's on one of the most random things. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you to, uh, I don't want you to come in and steal it. <laughs> but it's crazy because, you know, I, I think I have like 140 podcast episodes. And for that one to be the one that, that took off, it's just crazy to me. So I don't know. I've spent enough time talking. Let's get into some articles. Um, let me do this. Uh, we'll go to our Google search trends this morning. And this is not, I'm going to say this, it's not funny in a way, but it's its interesting. Let me just double check, make sure you can see. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, do you see the headline? Now, this just came up this morning. It's sad. It's a sad story. Woman killed by bison in Yellowstone National Park. Well, I was like, huh. That's interesting. How does that happen? It says an Ohio woman. I don't know that that matters where she's from. Uh, 25 years old, was gored and tossed 10 feet in the air after getting close to female bison on a boardwalk. So some of the things I'm not familiar with, I didn't know that uh, female bison had, I guess, horns. And I don't know how they measured the 10 feet in the air. So anyway. It says Ohio woman was killed by a bison after approaching the animal while visiting Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, park officials said on Tuesday. The 25-year-old woman was visiting the National Park from Grove City, Idaho, Ohio, about 20 minutes outside of Columbus. Now, see, I don't think that's relevant. It, like, for instance, if it was a 30-year-old from Switzerland, the issue is the person's still dead. Park officials say the woman whose name has not been released got within 10 feet of the female bison on a nearby boardwalk. The animal then gored her and tossed her 10 feet in the air. She was treated by park emergency medical staff on site and later transferred to Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center via ambulance. The woman died after sustaining a puncture wound and other injuries. It's kind of interesting. You'd think that they'd have like air, like like you know, a medevac air thing. I don't know. Two other people were within 25 feet of the same bison, but it is unclear if they were hurt. That's the other thing. Is so, it's so random. I mean, and I'd say one in three chances of getting attacked there, but that's wrong. Right. You guys know statistics and probabilities better than I do. I, I would think, though, it's a one in three. If there's three people there. But, I mean, then you look at the total population of bison attacks. Ah, it's tough. Anyway, for me, uh, it says bison, which can weigh up to 2,000 pounds, have injured more people than any other animal in Yellowstone, according to park officials. They caution visitors to stay at least 25 yards away from all large wildlife, including a sheep, deer, and moose, and 100 yards away from bears and wolves. Bison are known to be unpredictable animals that can charge at any moment and can run up to 35 miles per hour, but this is the first reported incident this year of a bison goring an individual. Now, let's, let's go here. Now you know I'm. You know it's dangerous when I do, when I do uh, transitions. You know that that goes poorly. So let me put forth a thought on this. Have you ever been to a baseball game? Uh, like a pro game? Yes, I'm. I'm pretty sure. What eighty percent of the population? Ninety percent of the population has. Okay, when they hit the ball, okay, and it goes in the stands. 
Have you been near a ball that goes in the stands? Have you ever heard it? I'll never forget. I was in Kansas City watching a game, and uh, as Bob Greenegg's in Hamlin. Do you remember him? Anyway, we were there and uh, hit a ball. It was the middle of the night. Nobody was at the Royal Stadium. And then the Royals were really bad. I don't know that they're any better. I mean, they won the World Series at some point, I think. But anyway, they weren't very good. And there was nobody there. Kauffman Stadium. I don't know if it's still called Kauffman Stadium. I haven't been paying attention. But anyway, they hit the ball, and it was a foul ball. And it was, it was, we were in the upper deck, and it, and it came up, and, it, and I could hear it. It was like, it was like a whoosh whoosh sound and it was coming like right at me and so i froze i froze couldn't move now i've been hit with a baseball before i've you know it's not i mean it hurts but okay uh but that that sound i'd never heard anything quite like that sound and uh and i'd never frozen before that was weird and so i just wonder if this poor woman who was at the uh at Yellowstone, if she just didn't freeze when she, you know, when when it came by. I mean, when a 2,000-pound animal's coming at you, um, you know, not a good situation. So, anyway, that's a shame. 25 years old. But, you know, I think, I think my point for bringing the story to you is kind of strange. We have this... We have this tendency to play down things. So, like, let's say somebody somebody broke into your house and stole your wedding ring. Okay. Some people would say, like, oh, well, at least you didn't lose your life. Like, you know, oh, it's, it's no big deal. Like, you can't put that person in jail for, like, 20 years for making one single mistake. Right? And so then, then it goes, it gets transferred into things like, um, behavior at national parks. So I say you have to be a hundred yards away from a deer or not a deer from a, from a wolf. And then they, the park ranger gives you a ticket cause you're too close or something. And then you say, well, this is ridiculous. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. Nothing ever happens. And if it does, you know, too bad. And now this person has been, been murdered by a, a bison and that's bad. Like she lost her life. And it's like, it's like trivial to people. That's, that's the thought is, you know, we trivial, trivialize rules that are designed to protect us at times. Yeah. And then normally your, your penalty isn't death. But in this case, it was now understand it's a wild animal this lady could have just been walking down the boardwalk minding her own business and then this thing just attacks you know and then in that case whose fault is it so you can't blame the victim they're dead it has to be the bison's fault but then you say well you shouldn't be on their lands and it's like it, it just gets very everything gets very very convoluted that's what I've noticed in my in my time. Let's go back on some other other articles. Let's look at the mortgage rate because I always think the mortgage rate is important. It's really about the affordability of homes in some ways. Obviously, if you have a three percent how you know a mortgage uh, rate at three percent, and a house is two hundred thousand, that's great. But if the house um, both increases in value and mortgage rates continue to go up, like say from three to five percent, now we're at two hundred and fifty, uh, two twenty five on a on a five percent. You're you're taking affordability away from people, even as prices increase. Very bad situation. Anyway, what do we got here? Oh. 5.36% on a 30-year fix. That's up 11 basis points from yesterday. Or we're at 5.25%. I'd prefer to stay under 5.5%. You can see we've kind of kind of had a, a top right there and kind of going down a little bit. 
we're in a dicey situation. A lot of people say, well, um, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people say there's um, so much demand for houses that it, it's not going to, the housing market is not going to crash. Um, it's going to land very smoothly and everything's going to be fine. But in, in my opinion, the damage really will have already been done because when you take, you know, a home that was $150,000, that's now two hundred ten, two hundred twenty thousand dollars uh, and it doesn't go back down, um, that's a significant hurdle for young people, uh, first time home buyers to ever be able to afford a home. And then you say, well, maybe everybody shouldn't be able to afford a home. I don't know that that's maybe I would say it differently. I think that maybe some people shouldn't own a home based on what I've seen in my career. Some people just can't handle owning a home. It's not, it's not going to work for them, but you should be able to afford a home if you want to buy one. And if you're working and you have good credit and all these things, you should be able to buy one. And you say, well, John, you can buy a, a, a house for like 20 grand. Even now it's like, yes, you can but you probably not going to, that's probably not going to be a very nice house. Probably not going to want to live there. There's a reason why it's 20. Just my thought. Okay. All right. Well, let's go look at some houses then. Uh, Miami, Florida is hot, right? Everybody wants to live in Florida. So I just looked at these houses here. Some of these I've already, already taken a look at, so I'm not interested in looking at them again, but I've got three that I thought were interesting. Let's start with the first one. $150 million seems like a lot of money, but on the market, 123 days built in 1913 to nine car garage property details. Miami's arched estate, a magnificent four plus acre parcel directly on Biscayne Bay that is comprised of two homes, each with sweeping views of Key Biscayne, downtown Miami, and 400 feet of water. I would say frontage is what they're talking about. The main residence, Indian Spring, was built in 1999 and designed for entertaining with a formal living room, grand salon, dining room, and garden room overlooking the terrace, pool, and bay. It includes a gourmet kitchen, office, five bedrooms, five baths, four and a half. I don't know. I don't know. It says five bedrooms, five BA, slash four and a half BA. So now I don't know what we're at. I have no idea. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, then there's plus two bedroom, two bath guest suite with a six car garage and tennis court. Villa Serena was built by W.J. Bryan in 1913 and has been expertly restored. Astonishing views are captured from the living room, dining room, sitting room, primary bedroom, office, and second floor bedrooms. Across the lush grounds finds a two bedroom guest house atop a three car garage. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity in the heart of Miami for $150 million. I mean, okay. I'm guessing these two properties are the two properties we're talking about. I mean, it looks nice, right? I mean, that's pretty sweet. And now we're inside the house. Now, I don't know which house this is. I don't know if this is the big house or the, the smaller house. But, I mean, it's gorgeous, right? I mean, we can't really we can't really kick it too hard, right? And look at that view. I don't particularly like the green, but whatevs. Now, as I was talking earlier in the program, you know, um, it's empty. Uh, I, you know, I was talking about how you have outdoor space. This this house built in 1913 isn't going to have a lot of outdoor space. You know, like it's not going to have some outdoor living space, but you know, it's worth looking at. Fifty pictures. That's enough for me. 150 million. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I don't, I don't have 150 million. Um, best of luck. It's been on the market 123 days. 
Now we've got this house here. This is in Miami. I thought it had a beautiful picture with a boat there. I was like, that's cool. $48 million. It's been on the market 60 days. and It's got a two-car garage. Let's see here. It says, located in a beautiful woodsy private enclave where only 26 homes enjoy its exclusivity. Camp Biscayne is one of Miami's best-kept secrets in the heart of Coconut Grove. Custom designed and built for its current owner, the tri-level gym was just renovated and is ready for its new owners. With over 300 feet of waterfront, a new seawall, multiple entertainment areas inside and out, this special house meets the most discerning demands of those who like to entertain and experience living one's best life on the open bay in Miami. The interior layout offers 180 degree views of sailboat bay, a true chef's kitchen, Jerusalem stone floors in living areas, and mahogany wood flooring, uh, mahogany wood floors adding a cozy and warming feeling to each room. Meticulous details and finishes, as well as soaring 30 feet coffered ceilings and many more added features. Well, let's take a look at it. I was just checking to make sure that you could see it. So 37 pictures. I love it. I mean, if you got $48 million, you know, and they show you a picture of it, you just go, right? I mean, there's no point in, like, I don't need to see, like, 150 pictures. Like, I'll just go see the property. Now, on this house, of course, you're looking at the views, right? I mean that, and there's the outdoor space. This house is built in 2002. We had some idea that an outdoor space was good and necessary. I mean, look at that view, right? That's what you're paying for. Rightly so. No, no, no complaint from me. I mean, the prop, the price for per square foot is six thousand five hundred and ninety four dollars. Let's look at the final house. This one here, I don't particularly like the way it's. It's been on the market 160, 106 days. It's got a six car garage, but I don't particularly like this being the first picture because I just, I mean, you know, and now it's like, oh, I'm going to have a neighbor here. Like for 30 million, it's not, it's not, you see, it's like, they, and he had a problem, or she, or whoever was listing this. I mean, you can't see it. There's trees everywhere. So you got no curb appeal. So, I mean, it's an interesting house. It's got interesting colors. It's, you know, it's nice. It's $30 million, though. You know, and like, so if you were doing, should this have been the picture? I don't know. I mean, this, the outdoor section, I mean, you're on the water. You should, you should, you know, promote that. But this house is, to me, is hurt because it doesn't have curb appeal. because You can't see it. It's got trees in front of it. And that's, you know, some people may want privacy. So it could be a very good thing for people. But it's it's tough it's it's not got the curb appeal that others have so anyway that's that last one there i wanted to go over some articles with you i'm just going to go over maybe maybe one maybe two we'll see what we have time for this is from redfin you know that i think that redfin's marketing through their uh, research department is the best in the industry okay that's just the way it is it says housing market update more sellers drop their prices but buyers find little relief Home buying is as competitive and costly as ever as soaring mortgage rates make the market less inviting for many would-be sellers. Now, this is on May 6th. I can tell you as of June 1st, I'm, I'm not seeing these huge price drops, at least in the market that I follow. Now, I'm, I'm mostly right now in, I'd say, University City in St. Louis, and I'm mostly in South County. Um, that's where mo in South City. Most of my buyers are in those three locations. I haven't really been out in uh, what I would say like Ladue, or West County. I've been in Baldwin. Baldwin has been tough, really tough. So 
but I, but I, but I mean, from what I'm seeing, I'm not seeing these huge price drops. It says the share of home sellers who dropped their asking price shot up to a six month high of 15% for the four weeks ending May 1st, up 9% from a year earlier. The 5.9% increase is the largest annual gain on record in Redfin's weekly housing data back through 2015. For home buyers, the typical monthly mortgage payment skyrocketed a record 42% to a new new high during the same period. So, you know, your mortgage rate went up 42%. You know, that's tough. Although growing share of sellers are responding to the palpable drop in home buyer demand by lowering their prices, Sellers remain far outnumbered by buyers, so the typical home flies off the market at the fastest pace on record and for more than its asking price. It says home buyers continue to be squeezed in early in nearly every way possible, which is causing some to take a step back from the market. And I've had buyers do that in my own uh, business. Unfortunately for buyers hoping to find a deal as competition cools, sellers are pulling back even faster, which is keeping the market deep in sellers' territory. So even though price drops are becoming more common, most homes are still selling above asking price in record time. So I have not seen people dropping prices and then us jumping in and getting a house at a good deal in my own market. I see houses that go on the market and then we put an offer in and we don't get it. 22, 23 other offers. It's, it's tough. Um, this is the, this is kind of the way they do their um, articles and I'm just going to go over just this short little leading into indicators of home buying activity. Um, I've got a link to the article. Um, as always in the uh, description. So if you want to, if you want to read it more closely, you can, but it says fewer people search for home for sale on Google uh, searches during the week ending April 30th. And they were down 7% from a year earlier. Homes for sale on Google is probably the biggest uh, search term. Uh, like John Schenk from Deerwood Realty, uh, www.deerwoodrealtystl.com is not getting that number one keyword. Uh, homes for sale in St. Louis I'm not getting that keyword either. Um, that competition has been taken over easily by uh, the Redfins, the Zillows, the uh, Trulias, the Movados of the world. Uh, so I'm just I'm just not in that in that category. It says the seasonally adjusted Redfin home buyer demand index, a measure of requests for home tours and other home buying services for Redfin agent, was down one percent year over year during the week ending May 1st. It dropped 10% in the past four weeks compared with a 1% decrease during the same period a year ago. Touring activity from the first week of January through May 1st was 24 percentage points behind the same period in 2021. Mortgage purchase applications were down 11% from a year earlier. Um, and then for the week ending May 5th, a 30-year mortgage rates increased to 5.27%, the highest level since August of 2009. Yeah, I mean... It's difficult. It's difficult. So that's that's the bottom line there. Let's do one other article since we have a little bit of time. I thought this was interesting. I thought we could in, enjoy it together. Uh, it's something that um, people feel passionately about, and, and I'll try to go over it when we get done with the article. It says, how accurate are, just how accurate are those online home value estimates? And it says... If you've ever gone online to check out the value of your home or to make comparison, you aren't alone. Online home value estimators can be a handy tool in some cases, but you have to understand their limitations. Zillow's estimate is perhaps the most well-known estimator, but Redfin has one too. Below, we talk about what you should know about home valuation tools, also known as auto automated valuation models or AVM. What is an automated valuation model? AVMs are computer-driven algorithms and formulas that use basic property features paired with pricing trends and local market information to create a value range or an estimated value for a home. There are some cases where a lender might use an AVM to quickly get a potential estimate of a value of the property. All of the AVMs use their own formulas and may pull data from different databases. As you might imagine, the estimates, reliability, and accuracy depend primarily on the quality and integrity of the data they're pulling information from. There are a lot of underlying assumptions made with an automated model. Now, I, I'll just continue. I, I, have, I have things to say about this, so we'll do it when we get done. It says, for example, AVMs work on the assumption that all properties are in a similar condition to one another. There's no way for these automated algorithms to consider if a home is in poor condition or if upgrades have been made. Due to fluctu in the fluctuations in the figures AVMs come to, lenders will set policies on whether they'll use them and if so, which they'll use now. Zillow, I believe, has come up with a way to use interior pictures to help determine the value of a home. But I'm telling you, 
Like, it's just a disaster. Well, I mean, how did the iBuying work for Zillow? If you need to have any proof about how, how, how that type of valuation model actually works in real life. How do Zillow's estimates work? Zillow's well-known estimates are based on what the company says is a proprietary algorithm. Zillow reports the estimates include data from public records and data users submit. The company doesn't claim that they're 100% accurate. That's good because they're not. If all the properties within a small radius are similar, the prices are more accurate because they're less likely to make major variances throwing off the algorithm. If the estimates come from a neighborhood with older homes, they're likely to be less accurate. So if you've got a house in a neighborhood built in, in the 1920s, it's just been a disaster. Some homes will have been improved and maintained over the years and some won't have been. The accuracy of evaluation is measured using an error rate. An error rate calculates how often the algorithm is wrong. More specifically, how often the value of a property is measured by the AVM is very different from the sales price of a home. So the, the estimates gets within 5% of a home's actual sales price more than 82% of the time. It's within 10% of the sales price more than 95% of the time and with 20% nearly 99% of the time. Now, understand that that says it's a percentage. So like on $500,000, if you're 20% off, that's a significant amount of money. That can sound pretty accurate at first, but less impressive when you forgot how many tens of thousands of dollars these variances can represent. Well, that's just what I said. This estimate medium error rate goes up nearly 7% for off-market home. If a home hasn't been sold lately, there's not much data that the AVM can pull it. Over time, the algorithms tend to get more accurate. Zillow says it will make offers to buy homes at their estimate price in some markets, or at least it did when Zillow's offer was operational, which it was recently announced was closing down. Yes, see that it didn't work so well. Realtor.com offers three figures. Realtor.com takes a different approach when on, when offers online users home value estimates. I didn't realize Realtor.com was doing that. The company pulls estimates from data provided by different companies it partners with. There are three estimates so people can see the picture of how much their home is worth versus is more variable than what they might have been getting from just one fig figure. Okay. Redfin versus Zillow. Redfin and Zillow are two competing tools for estimating the value of the home. They can sometimes give different figures for the same property. Overall, Zillow's estimate seems to be more accurate. The median error rate is a little lower than what's calculated for Redfin, including both on-market and off-market properties. Redfin is very transparent, though, which is an advantage it has. Redfin provides a lot of information on how they get their figures. You have to remember that while these tools may give you a general idea of how much a home is worth, they're not the same as an appraiser. Before a lender signs off on a home loan, they require an appraisal. Appraisers do a walkthrough and then write a report. They will also include market data and comparable properties. So this will be much more accurate than what you see online. Now, what's interesting is, um, yes, yes, let me let me go back to this frame because I think we're going to we're going to be done soon. Let me, let me couch a couple of things. One, I did have a lady write me an email. She refused to put a comment on my video, but she did say that she, uh, she had a mobile home in Texas and Redfin was changing the valuation of her mobile home and, uh, artificially causing the value of her property to go down. I can understand the sentiment. I can understand the sentiment. Um, and, and let's, let's take it for as far as we can. Let's take it out to the, uh, the racial aspects, the racist aspects of what some say are appraisals in general. Um, I don't, I don't approve of any sort of racist activity in real estate. I, I find it sickening. Um, if it is going on, I, I just, it just turns my stomach. Uh, there have been reports about appraisals being off if, a, if say, if a black person owns the property uh, and then they remove all of the indications that, of their race and then someone else appraises the property, it appraises for more. Um, you know, that's terrible. But what do you what happens when you when like Redfin just settled a huge fair housing complaint um, because they weren't offering all their services to, you know, communities of of, of color? Um so that's bad, but these automated valuation tools are also terrible in this sense. Like, uh, and I, I would say I noticed this in Detroit when I lived there. Okay. So let's say you say you live in a neighborhood and, um, if you've ever been in Detroit, like the real city, uh, where people live, not necessarily downtown, 
you know, you'll see a block and there'll be maybe there was a block maybe of 40 houses. And now there's only a block of maybe 20 houses. Like the rest are burnt down or it's a terrible situation, right? Or, or it's a vacant field. Um, but then what happens is, is these automated valuation metals, they'll take the value of a lot. Like say the, say the, the, the city bought the lot back for like 500 bucks and they, when, and they, when they tore the house down or say they say nobody paid taxes and they took it through. So now all of a sudden there's a sale price of $500 and then there could be a very nice family that owns a house and they've got it in beautiful condition. Okay. On that same street. Okay. And that, and then all of a sudden they get dinged by an automated valuation model uh, that says their, their house is worth nothing. You know, if this lot over here was worth 500, your house must not be worth more than like 25,000. Now these people spent money on their houses. Like, you know, they're just in maintenance and upkeep. They're probably in five and $6,000 a year. So it, it's quite a slap in the face to have these automated valuation models uh, in, in these communities where you really have to go and see each house for what it is to have some idea of what the value is. I mean, you cannot use uh, the comps that they pull on some of this stuff. It's just terrible. Uh, number two, as far as what happens to me when I go look at houses, uh, let's say a seller calls me and they say, how much do you think this house is worth? And I'll walk through it and you know, we'll go back and forth and I'll go pull comps and I'll say, based on what I've seen on the comps and based on what uh, I know about this area, I would say the house would be worth, you know, within this range. This is where we would want to be depend depending on your listing strategy. Are we going for the highest price in the neighborhood? Is that our strategy? Or is our strategy to try and sell this house, you know, the first weekend? You know, how are we, what is our strategy to sell this house? That matters on the pricing. Now, that's a strategy. It's not the value of the home. We don't know what the value of the home and we'll never know the value of the home until someone actually puts down money in an arm's length transaction and acquires the home. That's the moment that you know what a home is worth and it's never going to be the same. So it could be different between one week and the next one year and the next, you know, it's, it's always moving around. It's always changing. And so they'll say, well, you know, John, the Zestimate says, that the house is worth this. And I'll, and I'll say, well, that's great. What am I going to do with that? Is, is that? Have they ever been in the house? You know, what 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 qualifications do they have to, to show what this house is worth? Like how, you know, because they picked a house um, a mile away doesn't mean that this house is worth, worth that. Now, I've had people... Uh, pleasantly surprised when I say, I think we can get more than the Zillow estimate. It's not, it's not, the number is not helpful in any way. Um, so I don't even, I don't waste my time now. I think some people use the Zestimate, the Zillow estimate as, um, as a source of pride. And so what happens is, is like say in a zip code, the prices are going up in a zip code. Okay. Well, by you doing nothing, the value of your house goes up and you can actually track that on Zillow. You could say like in this market, if we were at 400,000, you know, at the start, well, probably now you're like 430 and you've done nothing. You've, you literally just go home every day and don't do anything. Uh, so you feel really good. Now what's going to happen if prices drop? Will your value of your home drop as well? Yes. Yes, it will. The best thing that you can do for a house is to get an appraisal. However, an appraiser can only go based on what has previously sold. Whereas an agent or a broker, real estate agent or broker has a better shot of getting an accurate price if they are number one, competent. Okay. That's, that's key. And then number two, uh, that they, that they, that they have a sense of what the market is doing. So for instance, if I think the market is softening, um, we may lower the asking price just a little bit to try to drive a little more traffic. If I think the market is strong, maybe we step on the gas and act, and add a little bit more to the house in the uh, hopes that we can get a good good sales price. That's the key. That's the art of uh, being a real estate agent, and that's that's why you want to hire somebody that kind of knows what they're doing. Um, anybody can go get a real estate license. 
there is some expertise. There's an art to selling real estate. And so um, as far as these automated valuation models, I, I wouldn't trust them in any way. And I say that uh, with the bias of being in the business and watching how the estimates have over time caused uh, serious, uh, dis I'd say, um, serious uh, disconnects between agents and their sellers in general. So with that, I think we've learned a lot today. We've talked about the automated valuation models. We've talked about home prices, I guess, in other places and other parts of the country. Uh, the asking price is being slashed. Um, hasn't happened here in St. Louis yet. Maybe it will soon. Um, but we kind of have to deal with what the market gives us. You know, we're not market makers by any stretch of the imagination. So we just have to go with what what I'm seeing. And currently, I'm just seeing still very, very, um, very, very competitive market out there for buyers. So with that, I hope you've had a good I hope we've had a good show. I, I enjoyed it. Um, remember, won't be won't, won't be here tomorrow, but I should be back on Friday. Uh, thank you for watching and I will catch you tomorrow.